Hi, and welcome to the Dark Web Vlogs, where I'm sharing the experiences I've had working with clients on some of the most outrageous deals being run over the dark web. So this job was one of the strangest ones for me, not because it was something from out of this world and there really wasn't anything beyond belief that happened. It was strange because of how it all was and what went down. I knew what we were doing there, that was clear, but at the same time, we felt a little bit like we were in the twilight zone after we got into it. Everything was just a bit off, and it stayed that way until it all came together in the end. And even then, things were not all well with the world. It was unbelievable because it was so possible, but it was disturbing. They call me the ghost. I'm ex-CIA and now a dark operative on the dark web. I've worked a lot of jobs. And this is my account of what happened when we went to the, one of the most impressive places I've ever seen and came out in shock. Take a listen and enjoy. All right. I'm actually at home when this whole thing starts, not at the warehouse or on a job. I had just turned down four different jobs and wasn't exactly in a hurry to get moving on anything too quickly. But then this request comes in. It seemed like it could be legit, and there was a mystery to it that somehow made me want to know more. The request was from a woman, and she's trying to track something down. And that isn't the strange part. There are a lot of those jobs out there, you know, lost and founds, thefts and things. But this one was a little bit different. This woman tells me that she has a collection. It's a family collection. And that someone has messed with their process and actually taken someone. She makes it clear that this is not a missing persons case, which I don't normally take, but that it's really a person or body that's gone missing. So... That gets my attention, even though it doesn't make sense at first. She adds that this person is crucial to their family's success and path forward and must be found. She asks if I will meet her to go over the details. And she doesn't live in the United States, mind you. This woman lives in England, old England, in North Yorkshire, in an old stately manor. Not exactly sure what all that is, but from what she says, it sounds like quite the place. And they sound like quite the family. This woman, who I'll call Edie, tells me that this request, and should I end up taking this job, requires secrecy and discretion. It's not something she's publicizing, and in fact, I would be the only one that would know of the issue in the first place. So, I mean, is this request jumping off my computer screen and screaming at me to take it? No, it's not. But like I said, I'm getting a sense of mystery that I like. I'm attracted to it. There's something about a good old-fashioned mystery that just pulls me in, and I'm sensing that. Right then, at the time I read the request, this seems like a refreshing change from a lot of the modern-day common issues that I hear about more often. I would like to know what this mystery in Old England is, and so to me, it's worth it to at least go check out, just for the heck of it. So I agree to meet her in North Yorkshire. And I take Frankie with me just because I'm walking into something I'm unfamiliar with and he's a great guy to have around in those situations. I tell her I will meet her and in three days I'm there. And when I get there, well, first we arrive in England and then there's a car waiting for us and we're taken to this place. And when we get there, let me tell you, it's not like anything you would think of in the modern world. It's not a big house like you'd think of or a show home of a celebrity, or anything like that. It was like we stepped right into history. I wanted to call it a small palace more than a mansion, or even a small castle. I mean, this place was amazing. It was made of old stone bricks, and it was shaped like a large square with four tall, tower-like structures on each of the four corners. made me think of Mr. Darcy, or Pride and Prejudice, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow, or Keira Knightley, because really, that's when we see stuff like this place in the movies, a place from a long time ago where no one today really lives or would exist. Maybe, you know, it's a tourist place that you might visit on vacation. But this place, this is where Edie lives. 
a car pulls up to the front of this place and this woman comes out and she is, you can tell at first glance, a very put together and elegant woman. Her dark hair is perfectly set and bouncing as she walks. She's wearing a dark blue dress with heels and she comes out waving. Frankie and I get out and she actually walks up to me and gives me a welcoming hug as if she knows me. But I soon learn that this is just the way that she is. She wants to be involved and if you're there, there's a reason. So everyone might as well get past any awkwardness and just get right into it. And I like that. So we're all best buds before we even get through the front door. But once inside, things do move to a more serious tone. She doesn't speak as she takes us through this place. And then we go back out to the courtyard out back, which is perfectly landscaped and trimmed and seems about as big as the palace itself. It's very nice, really nice. She has lemonade and martinis waiting for us. Well, Frankie and I choose the lemonade, but she isn't shy. And her butler pours her a pretty stiff martini. And she sits down in a chair opposite both Frankie and I. She thanks us for coming. And in between sips of her strong cocktail, she gets into why we're there. She excuses the butler and starts talking. And she tells us that her family has a history. And it's that history that keeps them going today. Unlike many families and people that move on from the people that pass and get on with the times, she says her family holds true to tradition and has a great respect for how they got to where they are in the first place. And that's because of the people in their past. And you can just tell by her demeanor and how she's talking that she's very serious. I mean, there is a person missing, of which I still don't have all the details, but I'm talking aside from that. Immediately, she comes across as a very wealthy English socialite who can be very fun and mix well in a crowd or with her guests, but she also has an extreme side. I can see that, and it's something I need to learn more about. She tells us in between chomping her olives that her grandfather has gone missing, and then very delicately she explains that he's already passed. He has left us, but that now he's gone missing. In her family, it doesn't matter if you've lost your ability to use the body you were given here. She explains, it is their belief that you continue on, that you continue to live in spirit, and that your energy continues to affect those still walking around in the physical sense. Now, Frankie and I are looking at each other and we're not all the way sure what she's talking about, but she keeps going and we keep listening. She says that it's been their family tradition for many, many years to keep those that have had the biggest influence on their family. It's important to them that those who really have been the glue that keeps it all together don't get lost in the shuffle over time. It's important that they remain, remain with the family and remain to continue the work they started. It's very confusing. The way she describes it all is that they are links, the ones that have passed. There's a long line of people that link the family together to the success that they have had from the very beginning. Without them, without those links, their family could fly off into nowhere and lose it all. She believes that behind their dollar is power. And she says, it's not power like we Americans might think of what, you know, we put out there in shows like Dallas and Dynasty. Yes, I know. Blast from the past. Or some sort of politician. It's a power of energy that follows a long line of those within the string or like links in a chain. The end is still a part of the beginning. And over time, all they're doing is adding links. But they never want to forget that first link, the one that started it all. And this all actually does sound good. It's almost like she's describing something that many of us have forgotten. You know, that's what we're thinking sitting there. A lot of the time, we can be caught up in where we're going next. What are we going to get out of what we're doing? Is it worth it? The what's in it for me syndrome. What she's describing, or at least what it sounds like she's describing, is more of a be thankful, be respectful. If you're of upper class status and the money and reputation that gives you this status is something that's been passed down to you, be thankful. Don't forget and give up the what's in it for me or how cool can I be because of it. That's at least what it seems like she's describing at that time. 
but then things change a little bit and all first impressions and personality representatives are set aside. The talks get a bit strange. And at first, Frankie and I aren't sure if it's the martinis talking, but then it becomes all too clear that no, it's her and she's serious. Remember, what we know so far is that there is a family member that has gone missing. It started to get a bit sketchy when she said that they had already passed, but we were patient and it was worth it because soon enough, more details come our way. She tells us how they keep their links, how they maintain their status basically, is that they keep the ones that matter. And we find out that what she means by that is that they keep them literally. She talks of how some people are above others. It's just a fact, according to her. And that they have such an impact on this world that it's not fair that they go out and disappear like the rest of us. In order for their impact of what they were to continue, they must continue. And then she just blurted it out. She's talking about mummification. She says that unlike you know, the old days in Egypt, how they believe that people went on to live this other eternal life. She believes their energy can actually stick around if it still has its vessel and that you can still draw from it. That they don't live on per se, but they still have something to give. She fully believes that this is why the family, her family, has continued on the successful path that they have had over all of these years because they kept the ones that mattered. When she's done with her full explanation of all of this, we learn that her family has had this tradition of mummifying those members of the family that have had the big impact over time and that they have this tomb right there at the palace underneath this structure that we're sitting just outside of at that time. She says that that is where her family is or the ones that mattered most. Now I'm listening and I'm in a bit of disbelief about what I'm hearing. And I've seen a lot, you know, so some members of their family are more worthy than others and they are saved or preserved. Well, yes, that is exactly what she said and what I heard. It's exactly it. And so the deal here is that Mr. Greer, Edwin, to be exact, her grandfather was all set to join the rest of the worthy crew down under, but something happened along the way. He left for the process, but he never came back. With her martini down, Edie gets up to make herself another one and asks us to walk with her. And we end up walking the grounds and she shares with us a little bit more about her family history. Their wealth dates back three centuries when they first purchased their land, which today is one of the most expensive pieces of land and property in the world. After this start, the family continued to invest in different properties, and they still invest today, and it resulted in continued wealth and success. On top of their land investments, they've owned sports teams. They've been involved in both political and social matters, among other things. They really have had a good run. Until now, according to Edie. And so, you know, we're listening to everything and these things are very impressive. Their palace and their land is very impressive. They have horses and stables, all that stuff. And it's all well and good, but I didn't travel all the way to England to hear about how great everything is. I was there to find out about this missing person and get any hints and tips on where Evie thinks this body is and find out what's up with it. We get back to the patio by the house and she tells us that she has no idea who would do something like this. Nobody even knows their personal business or traditions, but someone has clearly found out. And for some reason, they're out to stop this family from moving forward. And okay, let's back up a little bit. Frankie and I, just so you know, we're just sitting there at this giant place. And what do we have? We have a family who preserves the important ones, whatever that means. And for some reason, on their latest round, the person has been taken. I mean, really, this whole thing seems kind of messy to me. It doesn't all the way make sense. Who would want a mummified body of someone's family member? Well, Edie is just as confused. The other thing, though, that I'm curious about is what about the other family members? Where are they in all of this? I ask the question, but Edie tells us not to worry about them, that she hasn't even told them about the situation and that she is the one who handles this stuff and no one else in her family even knows about what has happened. Well, I know that she's telling me not to worry about them, but 
I mean, I'm thinking I'm going to have to at least talk to some of them. I mean, who are the other family members closest to this whole thing, closest to Edie? There's a chance that someone might know something. And I'm thinking as I sit there, is this a case I want to take? I mean, it really does seem very odd. I mean, number one, I was going to take some time off. You know, that's what I was planning on doing. And number two, this seems more like a whodunit or an investigative solve a crime case. Not really my kind of case to take, but there's still that mystery to this whole thing. And I can't really shake the fact that I'm into that part. I look over at Frankie and I can tell that he's in the exact same place I am. You know, it's different, but he's interested. He sort of shakes his head and I can see a small grin on his face. This case is a why not? And so why not? Why not take it? I tell her I will take it and track down her mummy. It really does seem like it can't be that hard, but I will find out soon enough that there's more to it all of this than it first seemed. So now that we've seen all the cool stuff that she had to show us and all the stuff she had to tell us, and we've done a lot of that talking now, it's time to get to these mummies, right? That is the focus and this tomb and all that stuff. And Edie agrees that we should see it all for ourselves. However, she's a bit reluctant at first. Finding something that's gone missing, you know, doesn't exactly mean that we get to have a view into all things personal in her and her family's life, but I do want and need to see what I'm dealing with. So we go inside and we walk through a very large, I guess I'd say living room. I mean, all the rooms here are so big that I'm not even sure what you would call them, you know, in a place like this. But anyway, she takes us through there and through about three more rooms until we reach the kitchen in the back. We go to the far side of that and she opens the door to a large pantry. There are cans and boxes and all kinds of things. You know, everything looks really nice. There's nothing odd or different about this pantry other than the size of it. I'm not sure why we're there, but then she goes for a second door that we didn't even see at first. It's on the back wall. It's locked, but Edie takes care of that. She opens it up and there's another room. And we peek inside of this second room and it had a few things in it, but it was not at all stocked like the first one. Well, without stepping inside of this room, Edie reaches in past some jars of jam that were there and presses a button. And then the floor, which looked like any other tiled floor, starts to move. The entire thing slides off to the side and it reveals a door. Edie steps inside the room now and messes with some combination lock that's on that door and she opens it. Not really sure what to expect, but we all head down and in following her lead. This, she tells us, is the family tomb that has been in their family for centuries. Just like the house, this underground area is pristine. There are no lights that are on down there, but we have a shadow view from the lights in the room above. Edie reaches into her pocket and pulls out a small box of matches. She lights a match and pulls a small lantern from the wall and lights it. We see gold railings. The steps that we came down are made of this beautiful stone. We can see there are large portraits of different family members on the walls, and there are very large, and she tells us handmade, rugs on the floor. I mean, everything is beautiful. It's like old time and just beautiful. There's a hallway or some kind of passageway in front of us, and we can't really see what's down there, but she looks at us and tells us that this is where the history is. And this is where the magic happens. Frankie and I have no idea what she means, but we follow her down the hallway. When we get to the end of it, there's actual electricity there. She flips on a couple of switches, reaches down to the ground to open up this gate. It's this black metal gate. You know, imagine, you know, in New York, how they unlock the metal gates in front of stores in the morning. It's kind of like that, only it's black. It's thick. It's obviously old. She pulls that up we enter this lighted room and I have to say this part was pretty amazing it's a very long room and wide and in a line on the left side and then also on the right side there are golden sarcophagi and I mean I've been to a lot of ancient exhibits of mummies probably like a lot of you and it can be a little strange standing there with one of those things you know thinking about how long they've been preserved and just the way they are but now in this room it looks like they're at least 15 of these things. It was something I've never seen before. Nothing like that. And I have to admit, it was a little bit disturbing knowing that these were all from the same family. And this was not an ancient exhibit. This was alive and growing 
group of mummies. Being in that room, it sort of hit you in the face and put everything that she had been saying right there in front of you. You could tell that she was a little bit uneasy about showing us this place, but she knew that she had no other choice. She walks into the room, looks around, and then turns back to us. And we're still standing closer to the entrance because we don't want to disturb anything and we just want to let her talk. Well, she turns back to us and explains that this is where the greatness happens. She starts to go through them one by one. They all have names on the front of them. There's her great, great, great grandfather. He's in the back left corner. There are aunts and uncles and more grandparents. Then I notice something. The ones that are on the right side of this room have the same golden finish, but instead of having a red ruby jewel on the top underneath what's supposed to be a representation of their face, they have a row of pearls. I ask her about it and she explains that the red ruby represents the first mummified family member and their birth date, of which falls in the month of July. Ruby is that birthstone. The pearls represent her birthstone in the month of June. She explains to us that since taking over the watch and management of the mummified remains, she felt the change made sense. And as if this wasn't strange enough, but taking in what it was, that comment that she made to us stood out to me. I mean, the whole idea of this room, I thought, was to preserve those that came before her, to respect the ones that helped build their small empire in the first place. And so this stood out to me because you would think that she would leave it as a ruby because that's the whole point of this whole thing. I note that and I just keep listening. Something's off. There's no doubt that this whole thing is very odd. She goes on to tell us that she's taken her new responsibilities very seriously and I have no doubt about that. She wanted to mark those that have fallen under her watch with this pearl to mark a new generation and new control over those that have come before her back in the day. The ruby represented the family and everybody knew that should you wear it on your person, that you were wearing it out of respect for those that had passed. It was well known among everyone in their family. But according to her, she says things have changed. And it's now the time of the pearl. We are in modern times, she said, and therefore a new and more current representative should be recognized here. And she had taken on that position. She urges us to come further into the room, and then she shows us a stone table that is empty. There's no sarcophagus. That's the container that a mummy would be in. She looks at me and tells me that this is his space, her grandfather Edwin, Mr. Edwin Greer. This was his spot, and she's at a loss of how he went to go through the process and now has gone missing. Looking around, I can't help but ask, what determines who ends up here? I mean, the whole thing's very overwhelming. You know, what happens to the rest of the family members? She's a bit distracted by that empty stone. She runs her hands over it. She lets out this deep sigh. And then she stands up straight, wipes her hands on her blue dress. And while still looking at that empty space, she explains that traditional burial is how her family started. That's still going on. They have reserved a large portion of this old cemetery west of town. And that's where the typical family member would go. But the people in this room, she says, are not typical. They were the great ones, she said. They were the ones that forged forward, broke through barriers, and kept things moving forward for everyone during their time and for those that would follow. Edie seems lost in some sort of far thought, but then she shakes it off and turns to us and reiterates that it is crucial that this body is found. If they want anything in their family to stay the same, he is the key to what they're doing now, and he must be located and brought to his final resting place so that he can continue to provide for the family. Again, I'm sitting there, I'm listening, but this is more of that strange talk. At least that's how I see it. I mean, people don't normally talk about those that have passed in this way. They might say that they have left behind a legacy or that they want to follow in their footsteps or something like that, but they don't say that they are still providing. It's almost like she's talking about this person as if they're still alive. And at this point, I can tell that Frankie is getting a little unsure, and I'm about there myself, really. We need to get things moving along, so I ask her if she has any clues or thoughts as to what's happened here. We close up our viewing at that point and she takes us back upstairs where she gives us some information on who, what, and where the mummification takes place. But she says again that she has no idea who could have done this or who would even want 
to do this, given the fact that no one should have known about it in the first place. We get the information and then Frankie and I have had about enough, you know, of this great palace. It's very impressive, but a little too strange. And now I've taken the job. So we both agree that we just want to get it done. One body. It's lost. So let's find it. So we leave there and first we go by this place where she gets her mummifications done. This is where the body was last. While we were visiting with Edie, she gave us her card, which isn't really a card for anything in particular, but it's a card for her. Anyway, she gives us her card and she's written on the back of it, writing that we're on this case and she supports all cooperation. And that's great because with who this woman is and how well known and successful the family is, that all means that walking around asking questions would just look like snooping and probably wouldn't be received in the best way. So now we have our endorsement, if you will, to ask away. We get to this place and it's a big house. And what it actually is, is a funeral home. And, you know, it also provides these other services. And I've seen places like this before. We walk up the wide steps and onto this big porch and we make our way inside. And we get in there and it's quiet. I mean, nobody's around. There's a room off to the left that's full of casket and urn choices. And we sort of meander into that area and start looking around while we wait for someone to hopefully show up. And we're looking at these crazy sterling deluxe caskets. I mean, they're really nice. And then this guy walks in. He's a little man, couldn't have been more than five feet tall. And he had on these really big glasses and a black rubber like apron. And he came up from the basement. So it's pretty obvious that he was at work. We show him the card and we tell him about our case and Mr. Greer. And he tells us that, yes, he did complete the mummification. It took him about 45 days from beginning to end. And he was all set to be sent back to Edie. But then when this guy got up the next morning, Edwin was gone. Said that in his 27 years in this location doing what he's doing, he has never had a break in. He felt terrible about it but he had no idea what could have happened. No one would even know what he was doing except for Edie. His special clientele had all the privacy in the world and he never shared any of that work with anyone. He said that after the grandfather passed, the only people that came by his place were the family. He did have a viewing and they did all of the regular stuff. There was a small ceremony with food and drink and people. There was nothing odd or strange about it or unusual. I asked him for a list of everyone that attended that ceremony, if he had that. Something that I would like to use because these would be the only people that knew Mr. Greer even ended up in this place to begin with. And he did have the list. So we took a copy of that. And then before we left, we asked to see his facilities. I wanted to know where he did his work and where Mr. Greer even was in this place. Where was he on his last night? Well, this man, who I'll go ahead and call Harry, takes us down to his basement area. Harry's been working on a body, and that's all out and exposed, and he apologizes for that, and that's his regular room. But then he opens up this large steel door to the right of everything, and he has us follow him into that area. And when we get in there, we see a whole different setup with all the things for the mummy process. Harry tells us that this is where Edwin was showed us where the gold sarcophagus was and how the body was in it. But it wasn't closed up yet. He never closes up Edie's bodies until she sees them. He was there and then he wasn't. That was it. That's all he knew. The only other thing that he can tell us is that every time Edie brings a body by, which has only happened four times since she's supposedly taken over this whole mummy thing, she asks for a small vial of their blood. You know, before they're dried out and everything is drained and replaced. She wants to have this special vial of blood. He doesn't know what she's doing with it. He thought she was probably saving it and figured that she just wants to hold on to the little bit of what would represent life of the people that she cared about. Like everything else that happened, this to me is just another strange thing. It doesn't all make sense. What is that? But we're going to keep an eye out for it. It may mean something and it may not. But okay, so we get done with Harry and we leave there. And at this point, we really do feel like we're detectives at this point, which is very unlike what we normally do. 
I thought about calling in Harley, but really at this point, there's nothing to call her in for. And Frankie and I have it. We've let the team know what we're up to, and we're just going to keep going. We have our list, and it shows who came by the funeral home. It's basically a copy of who signed in. But before we start running around to see everyone on that list, we look it over closely, thinking, you know, like a detective would, we want to look it over multiple times. Maybe we'll find that one thing that could stand out and tell us everything. Well, at least we hope we'll find that. After looking it over with a fine tooth comb multiple times, I actually do notice that there's one person that is signed in multiple times. It seems like everyone else went with the flow of what was going on, but there's one relative, Nathan Greer, who seems to have a special interest in what's going on. Nathan is Edie's cousin. Well, naturally, he is the one that we need to start with. We find out where he lives and he works and we head to where he is. It's about 5, 10 in the evening. So we plant ourselves right outside of his office building. And when he comes out, we introduce ourselves and show him Edie's card. And at first, he doesn't want to talk to us. That much is clear. He tells us that he has nothing to say and that he doesn't know why we need to speak to him anyway. He tells us that he loved his grandfather, but now he's gone. And he'd rather he was left with his grief and whatever it is that we're looking for, he says he doesn't have the answer. Well, you know what we're thinking. Of course, when someone says that and acts that way, they are the key to everything. We know this. It's obvious. We need to talk to him more. I try a different approach with him and tell him that not only are we trying to find this body and that it's Edie who contacted me, we are trying to figure out what actually happened. We're not on a side per se. It's just that we have taken this job and it's ours now. I start to get the sense that he doesn't love talking about Edie. He seems to shuffle and shift in his stance every time I mention her name. I tell him and make it clear that although she is the one that put in this request, I am just here to find one man. That's all I've agreed to do. Frankie and I work on him for a while. And Frankie can be quite intimidating when he wants to be and in different ways. With this guy, he's, you know, Frankie isn't trying to be a tough guy, but he's trying to be an influence. We eventually get Nathan to agree to talk to us, and at his request, we head to this pub that's close by. And then we go for it. We learn some interesting things from him. It takes a couple of pints for him to really open up, but he does start to break once he realizes and starts to believe that we are just there to do our job. And does he know where Edwin is? Well, he does. And it turns out that he is one of the family members that no longer believes in this mummification of family members. Truth be told, Edie, he says, is the only one that is for it anymore. He tells Frankie and I that she actually has an obsession about it and has become sort of a recluse in her life. It's not still a family thing, he says. It's not anything. But now he admits that he does have this body. It has been mummified. And when he got it, he wasn't exactly sure what to do with it. He broke into the funeral home one evening after the ceremony. He disappeared out of the crowd while he was at the ceremony and searched his way around until he found a big window in the back. And if he unlocked it, left it open for himself, he could get back in. And he did. He and his brother Adam broke in two nights later and took Edwin. But somehow their idea of putting him in the cemetery seems a little bit wrong at that point because of the state he was in. They've just been holding on to this mummy of his grandfather until they had a better feeling about what to do with it one way or the other. It takes us a long while sitting at that pub, but we get him to give up the body. And we tell him that we will not tell Edie where we got it And if he really wants to put a stop to something that's going on, we should give her the body and give her what she asked for and then find out what her intentions really are. Well, he realizes that the only way to put any sort of end to any of this would be to catch her in the act of something that he thinks is going on. And so now remember, the original request was from Edie, but technically then we did return the body and at that point we're free to work on anything else like all jobs when we're done we're done and we walk away so the next day we do return to the palace and i give her what she asked for we tell her that what has happened is not something that we can divulge to her but we have what she wanted 
and telling her all about it wasn't really in the request. The request was only to find the body and return it to her. She doesn't like all that. She really does want to know the rest of the information, but there's really not much she can do about it at that point. She has now gotten what she wanted. And at the end of the day, she seems satisfied with that. And our job is done. And we're on our way out of there. At least that's what she thinks. You know, we actually have a whole other piece to this thing that now involves Nathan. He wants to get to the bottom of what she's doing and put an end to what he thinks is a sick and twisted tradition that he no longer wants to have continue. He says no one in his family does. It's old school. It's done. They don't do it anymore. And guys, I got to tell you that this job went on for weeks. This was way before, obviously, I was doing any of this YouTube posting. You know, all the jobs I tell you about are from the past. Although, I've gotten pretty good at trying to still release stories while I'm out on the job. Anyway, we give Edie two days with Edwin before we accompany Nathan to the palace. This place belongs to the family. And although Edie lives there, she's not the only one with access and not the only one with the rights to be there. Nathan's very clear about this, and he picked the night because he's tried to get a hold of her, tried to come over, and she was willing to do something every day except for this one day. So in his mind, that means that something might be going on that she doesn't want anyone in there for. So he would like to go back then. And we do. We get to the palace that day at around 9.30 at night. All the lights outside are on, but it's pretty dark on the inside. He slowly makes his way in and we follow. And at this point, just so you know, we're not actually on a job, but in our minds, we're there to just see this thing through and help Nathan, now that he's come in contact with us, if there's anything actually going on here. We're involved so far. If there's anything more to the story, why not take the rest of it the rest of the way? Nathan disables the alarm. We make our way right into the front door. There's nothing happening. Everything is dark. We go over to the kitchen and then to the pantry and then to that second room. And that's a whole different story. There's some sort of low music playing. And it's not really a song, you know, that you might think about, you know, or think of when you think of a song. It's more like a long-winded meditation. The door to the basement is open. And as we all take a check of what's going on, it doesn't look like any of the actual lights are on. But there is light coming from somewhere. But it's too dim to be any of the actual electric lighting down there. But that door is open and something's going on. So we head down to check it out. And we're just following Nathan's lead. This is his place too. And he's heading in with all the confidence in the world. And we're there to back him up. So we're right behind him. And to be honest, I just felt like maybe this was, you know, this mummification thing was a practice from a long time ago. And it seemed like it got out of hand. Finding out that people are still practicing mummification was actually a surprise to me. I can't say I agree with it or disagree with it. It's everyone's personal choice. You know, I've since found out it's actually on the rise and coming back, which is, that's a little surprising too. But I also had this feeling that this was one of those strange situations where there's a family and people that just live life a little bit off the path that a lot of the rest of the people live and believe in. Not every job that I get is from someone that I understand. And that's just a fact of life. And this is one of those jobs that I absolutely did not understand. I was glad to be there though, because it was an exposure to something that I didn't know before. And anytime you get that chance, it's a chance worth taking, in my opinion. Learn about it, know about it, educate yourself, find out what's actually going on around you. But I will say, though, that when we got down there, what I saw was not what I expected. I wouldn't have expected it ever. Even if this was just a bizarre job, I still wouldn't have expected what I saw. We got down there and we're making our way down that hallway, that passageway. It's dark, but as we come upon the room with the sarcophagi, we see that Edie has candles set up, multiple candles. So the lighting's actually fairly good. She is sitting at the end of Edwin's stone block. He's now there, of course, because she has him back. And she's at his feet, on top of him, really, but on top of his feet, his calves. 
His container is open. You can see his wrapped up body. So she's sitting on top of the golden sarcophagi with the body inside. But, you know, at first, we're not exactly sure what she's doing there. And then we notice the bile and it becomes clear very quickly that she's going through some kind of ritual. This is something that Nathan's never seen or heard of in his family or history before. Yes, their family in the past did mummify the remains of those they felt would continue to provide good energy to the family, but it's looking like she's taking it a few steps further. Her eyes are closed. She's sort of swaying back and forth. She's taking in very big breaths as if she's almost sucking something up. This has all of our attention, but then there's something that Nathan says. He says that the bodies that have the pearls, because they all have names on them, he says those are new, new to him. And he whispers how he hasn't been there since he was a very small child. And he's looking at those names and says those people were never supposed to be mummified in the first place. He thought that Edwin was the first victim of this. He had no idea. He is having a realization that Edie has been doing this without any approval or consent of anyone in the family. We're all just watching this, but then all of a sudden, Nathan busts out of the shadows and he rushes the room. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take it anymore. And he grabs the vial of blood from her and pretty much picks her up and moves her aside. And she goes into a complete fit. She tells him that he's messing with the transfer. None of us know what she's talking about, but Nathan wants to know what the heck is going on. She's just screaming and she's screaming out that she needs that vial of blood. She's screaming out that the family will fail and that everything will fall apart. She needs to transfer him to her, that she is in charge. If she doesn't have it, everything will fall down. She does not finish what she started. Nothing will go good from this moment on. This woman, very classy, very elegant as we met her, is going mad right in front of us. She doesn't even look like the same person we met that day when she came out and waved and was all put together. She's in a white dress at the moment, which now has blood all over it where the vial has spilled. She's on the floor and off in the corner. And now at this point, Frank and I are starting to feel a little bit in the way. I mean, this is a serious family matter and our job was done. And now here we are right in the middle of this whole thing. But Nathan, he's just looking at us and he's in shock and he's afraid and he's angry. We can't just leave him there. Frankie goes over to Edie and just his size and presence so close to her has her distracted. It's temporary, but it lasts long enough for him to get her out of that basement. I follow and then Nathan comes up and when we see him come up, it's as if he came up from being underwater or something. He's completely worn out and it's like he's taking in his last chance at a gulp of air. He has tears as well. One of the people down there was his mother. One of those people on the Pearl side with their name. She passed too soon, he told us, from a terminal illness. And all this time, he thought he was visiting her grave in the family cemetery. And he's besides himself. He's almost hysterical. The scene we walked into that night was almost on the verge of grotesque. It was so out there. And with everything that we see and do, it was out there in this different way. We had to calm Nathan down. We had to get Edie out of this trance she had put herself in. We got Adam's number from Nathan and called him to the scene. This was a family nightmare. It was a situation where we no longer seemed to belong there. Like we felt like it was time for us to go. But I will say that it was good that we were there because this really could have gotten completely out of hand. Not only would have Edie continued, Nathan never would have went there. And who knows what would have happened to Edwin. Nathan was trying to call out for justice. He wanted those bodies buried. Those people did not have the choice, and actually, they had already made a choice, right? It was Edie who took it upon herself to decide what was the real and right thing to do against what they wished for. After things got to a point where this night was a total bust, Nathan needed help. And I called in a few of my contacts to help organize the situation because he was in no state of anything to be able to fully absorb what he had found or organize anything that was going on. He was in almost a state of shock. All he knew 
was that the pearl mummies all had gravestones in their family cemetery, including his mother, and other relatives have also been going to the cemetery, visiting their loved ones, not knowing that they really weren't there. It was very hard to break him away from his mother's sarcophagus, really. The whole thing, in the end, was beyond disturbing. Nathan did get what he wanted, and we ended up meeting several other family members. They were all very grateful for this takedown, basically, of a situation that nobody ever approved. Nobody wanted this. Edie got consumed. It wasn't even as if she was close to some of these people that had passed, but what she wanted was what they could provide her, what they were when they were here with us, what she believed they could give her. She looked very confident and secure. She really did. But what you realize is that she was none of those things. She could not exist without the powers of those that came before her. She really, and everything that she was, believed that these people that laid the ground roots of what this family was were the only thing that would keep it going. I mean, instead of actually doing something for herself or her family, she believed it was the people that were there before her that could still pass down what they knew and have an effect on the here and now. And she wanted that. It was actually very sad in a way to watch her realize how what she'd been doing is over. Her private little tomb of mummies was discovered and right before her eyes, it was being broken apart. She would no longer be living in that palace, not for a while anyway. Nathan made arrangements for her to get the help that she actually needed. And then there was a relief that came over the rest of the family, you know, knowing that everyone was where they should be. The idea of mummifying the members of their family in the old days was a belief they thought then, but it didn't fit now. It didn't fit anymore. Life is moving on and people were in a different time and it was no longer the right thing to do. This job left Frankie and I with this just bad feeling. It felt much better once everything seemed to be getting taken care of, but the idea that someone cannot live their own life was unsettling. Edie could not do it. Of course, we all love and respect those we cared for that have left us, but we always need to remember that they believed in us also. That is how we continue. That's how it goes. You take the torch and you go next. That's harder to do for some than others. Frankie and I left that job and we met the rest of the team back at the warehouse. And even though this isn't, you know, this job wasn't our family and this wasn't even a job that we would typically take, the coming down from it all took a while. The little break that I was looking for before this job came to me It was something that we needed now more than ever. And we did take it. 10 days, no requests, no jobs. And just take that time to think and reflect about what happened and the types of jobs that we want to take going forward. I mean, this was back when we were figuring it all out, right? I spoke in my blog on Monday about things that maybe didn't work out or jobs that I had to turn down. And I can't really say with this that I wished I turned it down. But at the same time, It left a bad taste in our mouths. This job was not a typical job for me to take, like I said, and it's not a typical job for me to share with you. But given the questions that you guys have had as of late, I thought it was a little bit more fitting to share with you this job, you know, a job that wasn't all action, but is really a part of the real world that's out there. It's still happening, even if it's not booms and lights and exciting. Not everything that is surprising has to be aliens or black holes or things of legend. Sometimes the most normal people that we see every day, people we admire, living the best life that we think we could ever imagine, also have surprises. It's something good to remember. You know, envy is not good. This family is definitely a family to envy. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if you're an outsider... Everyone has something put in front of them that they have to deal with. This woman, who everyone thought was completely in control and in charge of her life and everything else, she wasn't what anyone thought she was. In the end, after this disturbing off job, it was nice that we knew that things were put right again for that family. I appreciate that you took some time to spend with me on this job 
and I hope that you enjoyed the vlog. Like always, give it a like, subscribe, turn on your notifications if that's your thing so that you know when I post next. And thank you for listening. And until next time, and I will talk to you all soon. And okay, that's a wrap. See y'all next time.